Quick, try to go from a bomb battlefield to Wamp's fortress right now. <laughs> That's right, you can't. At least, not without a little something in the middle. Perhaps a special central level that houses not only entrances to the proper stages, but its own challenges, secrets, and storytelling. Yes, this is what we in the very smart business call a hub world. Hub worlds in video games are something I've always loved. Uh, probably a little too much. Maybe more than most people. Sure, you could say that hub worlds are just fancy menus with some gameplay sprinkled in, but frankly, that's super reductive. To me, the best hub worlds represent not just a safe playground to get a feel for things before moving on to the real game, but a living, breathing world in its own right that makes the entire game feel complete. On that note, the first one I'd like to highlight isn't Super Mario 64, but Super Mario Sunshine. As much as I love Peach's castle and know it like the back of my hand, Delfino Plaza is a perfect example of what I was just talking about. Sure, just like its predecessor, the plaza lends itself perfectly to learning all of Mario's moves, space to run, dive, and jump, neighboring buildings to wall kick between, tight ropes to walk across, gaps to hover over, and so on. It also has all the secrets you could wish for in a hub world. Some are a Metroidvania-style come back here with the right tool deal, while others just require a bit of exploration and ingenuity. And a handful of these open up main levels and even some bonus secret stages, several of which are... Dog sh They're dog sh but what really sells Delfino Plaza to me is that it feels like a real lived-in place. Again, Peach's Castle is great, but a lot of its iconic rooms raise more questions than answers. Like, ah yes, the princess's spatial distortion hall, one of her favorites. With Delfino Plaza though, it's a full-fledged civilization, with homes, docks, monuments, a marketplace, and even the prison Mario found himself locked up in. Even with the level entrances, they're contextualized either as part of the town, or a result of the pollution that's plaguing the town. Oh, and also the residents are really mean to Mario, and I think that's funny. <laughs> this is a hub world at its best. Another one of my favorite hub worlds can be found in Banjo-Kazooie. Although we're now dealing with a villain's hideout rather than a whole society, that doesn't stop Gruntilda's lair from being just as lively and fun. Of course, it still serves its purpose as a playground, and there's still plenty of secrets to uncover around every corner. Probably its most defining feature, though, is the theming of each section. The entrance of each level is found in a room that perfectly matches that stage's aesthetic, complete with dynamic music to boot. Heading to Freeze Easy Peak? Well, just make your way through the snow and step into the giant advent calendar. <laughs> Dead set on Mad Monster Mansion? Sure thing, as long as you're man enough to brave the haunted graveyard. <laughs> Visiting Treasure Trove Cove? Or you're gonna feel like a pirate then, matey. <laughs> Now make no mistake, hub worlds definitely aren't just for 3D platformers. They can be found and work just as well in pretty much any genre. Case in point, Dark Souls, starring the iconic Firelink Shrine. On the surface, this tiny little campground doesn't seem like much, but as you progress through the game and repeatedly return here, its depth reveals itself. Not only does it become the home of all the wacky characters you meet throughout your adventure, including my man, Trusty Patches, but it also puts a very interesting spin on its level entrances. While the earlier Demon Souls had a hub filled with plain old warps to the various levels, Dark Souls' equivalent is a series of locked doors and elevators within Firelink Shrine that you typically have to open from the other side. Compared to abstract warps, this approach makes the game's world appear far more interconnected and makes great use of the shortcuts that are such a key part of exploration in Dark Souls. Oftentimes, that's an important part of a hub world, representing the game's identity in microcosm. For another example of that, 
Take a look at Hades. Roguelites and dungeon crawlers usually need a home base where the player can take a breather and prepare for their next run, and the House of Hades serves that purpose perfectly. But of course, I'm not bringing it up just because you can buy upgrades and try out new weapons. Just as important as all that are the characters that roam these halls. When you're not getting your skull caved in by the Minotaur and his annoying little brother, you can take time to mingle with the denizens of the house. And since the repeated runs are integrated into the narrative, the NPC dialogue changes every time you return to the house, with the characters commenting on your progress. On top of that, the conversations between Zagreus and his f***ed up family are masterfully written and voice acted, so plenty of reasons to regularly interact with this area. Oh, also you can decorate the place. Never downplay these sorts of dumb superfluous features when it comes to hub worlds. See also, rolling up to Moss Eisley can Tina and Lego Star Wars and starting a bar fight between Kiati Mundi, Rebel Friend, and Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Sorry. One might consider the towns in RPGs as their own type of hub world. Uh, I don't think this always checks out. Like, if the game has a ton of towns and cities with more or less equal importance. Yeah, no, that doesn't count. That's almost like calling the overworld map of a 2D platformer a hub world. But some examples that definitely do count are the modern Persona games and Fire Emblem Three Houses. In these games, whenever you're not in the core combat-filled gameplay, you're brought back to a soul central safe haven. I mean, the world might be in peril, but you gotta get to math class. Or kill class. Because of how these games play, it's not like you can practice your moves back home or anything like that. But these hubs still give you the chance to upgrade your stats, shop for new items and equipment, and interact with various characters, maybe even picking up a side quest or two along the way. In addition, all of these games revolve around a calendar system, so not only do you have a limited time to do all of those things, but like Hades, the hub and its residents gradually change to reflect whatever's happening in the story. Now, as much as I love a good hub world, not everything is so hunky-dory. On the topic of Fire Emblem Three Houses, Garrick Mach Monastery is a great setting that has plenty to do and feels alive, but it doesn't look great graphically, and certain parts of it really tank the frame rate for a sec. Give it up for Koei Tecmo, the kings of optimization. More importantly though, over the course of a long playthrough where you're frequently going about the same routine, running around the place can start to get old, and there will be times where you wish you could just use a simple menu or something which seems to be an unfortunately common pitfall for hub worlds. In fact, I almost feel the same way about Delfino Plaza's successor, Super Mario Galaxy's Comet Observatory. This place has a wonderful visual design and atmosphere but that's kind of all it has going for it. Unlike the series' previous hubs, the Comet Observatory is way too small, cramped, and relatively empty to serve as a proper playground for Mario's moveset. Not only that, but it's severely lacking in secrets, with no stars to be found within the hub, and all the levels either being localized in these homogenized domes, or just accessed through NPCs out in the open. The one truly special thing the Comet Observatory has going for it is Rosalina's storybook, but that's just a series of cutscenes tucked away in a single room. Again, it gets to the point where this might as well just be a menu. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Banjo-Tooie traded in Gruntilda's lair for the expansive Isle of Hags. And hey, this hub does reflect the identity of the game as a whole, in that, as great as it is, it's way too big for its own good. It just takes way too long to get from one area to another on foot, without that many interesting platforming challenges or secrets to keep you occupied. Of course, there are warp points in each of the main sections, but not only is that putting a band-aid over a bullet hole, those problems also exist in each specific area, with a whole lot of empty space and, once more, or not much to work with to use the environment as a playground. These common issues with hub worlds may be why we don't really see them too often nowadays, at least compared to previous generations. But while the traditional hub world has become a rarer and rarer <laughs> sight, I find that modern games carry on their spirit in rather creative ways. To check in one more time with our pal Mario, Super Mario Odyssey completely forgoes the central hub world of its predecessors. However, most of the kingdoms basically have their own hub baked into the level. For 
For instance, the Sand Kingdom starts you out in a small, bustling town. Just like any hub world of the past, there are NPCs to talk to, shops to visit, and collectibles to nab. On top of that, the architecture is specifically set up to allow you to experiment with Mario's movement and capture ability. And when you're done here, there's multiple directions you can trek out towards, cementing the game's focus on open-ended exploration. Speaking of which, let's talk about open world games. After all, you can make the argument that their defining feature, you know, the open world, is sort of like one big hub world. Whenever you're not actively pursuing a mission, a good open world game lets you explore the land as much as you want, creating your own fun, finding secrets and collectibles, and taking in the world building narrative and characters in a unique way. If that doesn't sound familiar, have you not been paying attention? Come on, man. No matter what form it takes, whether it's as standard and recognizable as it gets, or a take with more creative liberties, video game hub worlds hold a special place in my heart. Even when they have their problems, they go a long way in making the game feel that much more jam-packed with content. And they're an important part of selling the setting as a real, lived-in world. And what could I say? That matters a lot to me when I'm playing a game, regardless of the genre, era, or scope. That's why I just spent about 10 minutes rattling on about this stuff. Because ultimately, that's the beauty of hub worlds.